All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today for our Saving Life on Earth webinar series. I'm Tierra Curry. I'm a senior scientist here at the center based in Portland, Oregon. And today we're going to talk about conservation, consumption, population. And these can be really sensitive topics. June 11th is World Population Day. And so that's why we're bringing you this webinar today. We actually have an entire population and sustainability program that works on these issues. So we're very excited to share with you the awesome work that they do. Just today, the International Union for Conservation of Nature updated their red list assessment and it showed that 27% of all the species that they assess for conservation risk are threatened with extinction. That's kind of overwhelming. That includes one in four mammals and humans are mammals. So we know that we're in the middle of an extinction crisis and we're causing the extinction crisis and, and population and consumption are two of the primary drivers. So today we're gonna to talk to you about what we can do about that and how you can get involved. Humans take up so much space and we've seen that clearly during the coronavirus pandemic because by not taking up space, when we sheltered in space, wildlife took over all of these places. And so vehicle mortalities were down for mountain lions in Southern California. Sea turtles had a really good nesting year on beaches and snowy plovers in California expanded their range on nesting beaches for the first time in a long time because we weren't taking up so much space. Um, a couple of technical notes before we get started. We've disabled chat because we heard from you guys that that can be distracting tomorrow. Our awesome speakers will be on Slack from noon to one Pacific if you want to continue the conversation. We're going to save 20 minutes at the end of today's discussion for questions and answers and the ones that we don't get to, you can ask them tomorrow on Slack. And you'll also get an email that'll have a link to the video of this webinar, a link to an action alert so you can help take action on these issues and how to join Slack if you're not already on there. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to our speakers to introduce themselves and thank you for being here. Thanks, Tiara. Uh, it's great to be with you all. Uh, my name's Kelly and my pronouns are she and her. We did just want to kind of give a little bit of background about ourselves. So I spent my childhood in Nebraska, but I went to NC State and got a bachelor's in science in natural resources. And when I graduated, I started my environmental career working in the recycling industry and I did that for 15 years. So this explains why you see me next to posing next to a bunch of recycling bins. That's often where you would find me. About five years ago, I saw that recycling alone was problematic. We needed to be decreasing production and consumption of stuff. And at the same time, I was looking for a career change and I became interested in working at the intersection of health and the environment. So I went back to school and I got a master's in public health at the University of South Florida. And one of these interconnected health and environmental topics that I could work on was, was family planning. And I really had this personal interest in that. And so I became a family planning counselor. And I really didn't think there was a job out there for me um, that would marry these two interests of mine, but I was wrong. I couldn't be happy to, happier to have found this um, position at the center, allowing me to work on family planning and waste prevention. So I started with the center last year and my work involves visiting various college campuses, which are the pictures that you see on the other side of the screen. And I work to bring together the environmental science department or club with the women's center or campus health clinic so that we can talk about people's impact on the environment between two groups that may not normally chat with each other. Um, and then I also participated in several other conferences uh, trying to get this interdisciplinary work in front of potential collaborators. Um, and before I turn it over to Sarah, I just want to uh, give a quick shout out to my mom. It is her birthday today and I think she's watching. So happy birthday, mom. Hi, I'm Sarah Bailey and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm the Endangered Species Condoms Coordinator uh, in the Population and Sustainability Program at the Center. Um, I've always loved wildlife um, and I have a background in animal care and wildlife rehabilitation um, and environmental education, which are the top two pictures you'll see on that slide. Um, I was first introduced to the Center uh, via the Endangered Species Condoms uh, years before I actually even started working here. Um, and I've just really enjoyed getting to do the creative outreach work, outreach work that advocates not only for the environment, but also reproductive rights and show people how these areas are connected. 
Um, so the bottom two pictures, um, that's me with uh, some advocates from Planned Parenthood when we did a speaking series with them showing how these issues are connected. And then the other picture is us doing a condom distribution in Times Square for Valentine's Day last year. Uh, and Kelly's actually the one in the dugong costume and the billboards behind us say, wrap your schlong, save the dugong. That's awesome. Um, so you guys, what is the connection between human population and the extinction crisis? Well, uh, there are nearly 8 billion people on the planet today, and 50 years ago there were about half as many. And while human population has doubled, wildlife populations have plummeted by half, which is what you're seeing here on the screen. And that is no coincidence. Every person on the planet requires land, water, food, and energy to survive, and with rapid population growth and destructive consumption, we are crowding out wildlife. While we have to stop using fossil fuels, transform what we eat, hold polluting corporations accountable, we also have to slow our population growth if we're going to save room for other species to thrive. And while the rate of growth has slowed a bit, we still add about 227,000 people to the planet every day, and by 2050, there will be 10 billion of us. So that makes sense at the macro level, but what are the, some of the specific ways that human population is putting pressure on wildlife populations? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, so there's a number of ways that our growing population impacts endangered species, and unfortunately, human-caused extinctions are nothing new. Uh, the passenger pigeon is a classic example. Uh, in the early 1800s, there were reports of flocks of passenger pigeons that were described as being so large that they darkened the midday sky. Um, but by the late 1800s, they were noticeably fewer birds, um, and the last individuals were gone by the early 1900s. Uh, the relentless unchecked hunting pressure wiped out the species within a century. Uh, a present day example of a less widespread species is the Bethany Beach Firefly. And this species has a small range along the Delaware coast um, that's highly desired for development. Um, and it's really vulnerable to rising sea levels and the increases in storm surges caused by climate change. And then other threats that are a little more widespread um, will include the pesticides we spray in our agricultural crops, um, those poison monarch butterflies, among other species, um, pollution runoff from livestock operations that destroy the freshwater habitat of the hellbender, um, and our sprawling infrastructure um, of roads and power lines that disrupt migration patterns and fragment the habitat of species uh, that need uninterrupted space to move about and thrive. Um, and these are always the population pressures like our growing food and building infrastructure for an unsustainable population. Um, increased threats to wildlife and wild spaces. So what do we do about it? How do we actually slow down population growth? So this is the most common question I get when I uh, talk about what I do. People are always like, how does family planning relate to wildlife? Well, my colleague Linda graciously worked with me on this graphic to try to depict the cause and effect of this work. So hopefully by the end of this call, Sarah and I will have addressed each of these items unplanned pregnancies, empowerment of women and girls, making room for wildlife, and, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, building resilience. So the best solutions are those that advance human rights like education for all, voluntary family planning, universal access to contraceptive and contraception and reproductive health care, including abortion. When people have the ability to choose if and when to have children, they tend to choose smaller families. And when there's gender equity, including girls being able to stay in school and have equal opportunities, they tend to delay starting a family, they increase the length of time between births and have fewer children, all of which benefit the planet too. But let's be clear, the center denounces any type of population control, coercion, eco-fascism, genocide, or eugenics. Because population and extraction and production are global issues that transcend national borders, we do not view immigration policy as the appropriate target for addressing these issues. We believe that U.S. immigration policy should be rooted in human dignity and the recognition of immigration and the pursuit of better circumstances as a human right. And reducing fertility rates by increasing human rights has worked. For example, Thailand implemented a voluntary family planning program in the 60s that allowed midwives and nurses to prescribe contraceptives and made condoms readily available in rural communities. There was a key political proponent of the program and he was known as the condom king. 
and he used humor to challenge attitudes and destigmatize family planning. He held condom blowing competitions in schools and promoted a popular condom themed restaurant and resort chain called Cabbages and Condoms. And it worked. Thailand's fertility rate dropped from six to two in 20 years. Wow, that's awesome. But in the US, isn't it true that the fertility rate is down? So does that mean that we shouldn't worry about population? Yeah, so while the US does have a low fertility rate, um, every child born here will have an outsized impact on the planet. So in terms of climate change alone, Americans have the largest carbon footprint in the world. And we only make up 5% of the global population, uh, but we admit 15% of the world's carbon emissions. Um, so this graphic comes from a study that came out a few years ago. Uh, it illustrates the comparison in annual emission savings uh, between many commonly cited green actions. So you'll see the different actions along the bottom and how many tons of carbon dioxide emissions are saved uh, each year by taking that action. So you'll see the classic ones, recycling, uh, switching to a hybrid car, plant-based diets, um, and then all the way to the right, you'll see the impact of having one less child, which is one we often don't hear about. And having one less child in the US saves more than 58 tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year. Um, and this is actually 20 times more effective at reducing greenhouse gas emissions over your lifetime uh, than many other actions like recycling, getting a hybrid car combined. Um, and this is because having a child multiplies your carbon le legacy five times over as they grow up to be a consumer too and likely have children of their own. And we're not suggesting people use this information uh, to prevent not having kids at all or to say that there's any ideal number of children to have. We just want people to understand how large the impact is. Uh, China's one child policy is an example of this that often comes up. Um, and we already know there were terrible human rights implications caused by this and is exactly the kind of policy that we do not advocate for. Um, what we want to understand is that only half of all pregnancies in the US are planned. So even though our fertility rate is not as high as those in other nations, we still have a lot of work to do to take full responsibility for our reproductive futures. Seems like most people probably don't know that half of pregnancies in the US are unplanned. Um, but like the whole human rights issue is really complicated. So can the solutions to population growth actually increase human rights? And why don't we hear more about this? Yeah, this can be an understandably sensitive topic. Um, and that's because the rights and dignity of black, indigenous and other people of color were violated in the name of population control. And this caused long-term harm and reproductive oppression. Um, and just a note about the phrase population control uh, when discussing this work. Um, control is often tacked on after population, but we are very conscious about not using that phrase. Uh, we don't want to control anyone. Um, and as, as we will discuss later, we propose equitable policies that give people autonomy over their reproductive choices. Um, the environmental movement needs to acknowledge this and counteract coercive policies by supporting reproductive rights and justice allies. Because um, when we sweep this history under the rug or avoid the topic because extremists are trying to co-opt the issue, um, we're not only leaving out a critical piece of the puzzle, but we miss an opportunity to confront xenophobia and inequality as perspectives that have no place in this movement. So what we want is to help people comfortably talk about voluntary family planning, sex ed, and the systematic barriers to reproductive justice that hurt people on the planet. Um, especially since we know young people are already making these connections as they question whether or not to have children in the middle of a climate crisis. So what are some of the barriers and solutions to family planning here in the United States? Well, as I mentioned in my intro, I am a family planning counselor and my interest really comes from this personal place. My reproductive years were in the Midwest and the South and I don't believe I was given all the contraceptive options available to me at the time. And the center works to break down barriers that limit access to sexual and reproductive health care and the full range of contraceptives by supporting US reproductive health rights and justice allies. So we have contraceptive deserts in the United States. Um, that is an area that lacks access to a health center that offers the full range of contraceptive methods. According to Power to Decide, 19 million people are in need of publicly funded contraception and 95% of them live in these deserts. So I recommend you visit this website on the screen and drill down into your county to see how your county and community ranks. The Title X Family Planning Program was created to bridge the gap in care by providing funding for reproductive health services for low-income people. 
After a failed attempt to cut all Title X funding, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services rules undermine the program by promoting natural family planning over other contraceptive methods, emphasizing discredited abstinence-only messages among adolescents, and blocking funding for clinics that provide, refer to, or discuss abortion services. As a result, many organizations were forced to close or restrict their services, impacting people and the planet. And also COVID has brought to light our need for continued support to build systems for online and telehealth appointments to get contraceptive refills mailed directly to one's home. But this varies per state. So until it's standardized, people have to check with their local provider or health department or an online organization, organization like Planned Parenthood Direct, NERCs, or the Pill Club to know what's available. And another way to improve contraceptive access would be to provide birth control pills over the counter at a pharmacy, just like essential, other essential medicine. The program Free the Pill is advocating for making birth control pills truly over the counter by placing them on store shelves, allowing people to skip the pharmacist and healthcare provider's office. And some states are allowing pharmacists to prescribe birth control similar to the way they now do with flu shots. So, there are all kinds of ways we could be improving access to contraception. The good news is the majority believe in these solutions. And hot off the presses is a recent, um, on, on the screen here, you're seeing some results of a recent randomized national survey that the center conducted around population that showed that 80% of respondents agree that all types of birth control should be legal, free, and easily accessible and 46% are currently voting for policymakers who support reproductive rights. However, as we work on these solutions, it's important to keep in mind reproductive health care is riddled with inequalities. First, it's harder for Black women to get condoms due to shorter pharmacy hours near their homes, fewer female pharmacists and self-checkout lanes that make them feel comfortable, and often condoms are locked behind a closed cabinet. According to a new study, Black women face greater harm than whites from pregnancy risks associated with climate change, and they're already on the front lines of pollution and experiencing worse pregnancy outcomes, often related to inadequate healthcare access. The reproductive justice movement was founded by Black women calling for a new approach that recognizes the unique needs of women of color and understands reproductive freedom as a life or death issue. In the environmental movement, we must embrace those basic rights and support the struggle for Black, Indigenous, and people of color to have good health care along with a safe environment. Absolutely. Um, can you talk to us more about the other solutions that you talked about around education and equity? Yeah, uh, so we also want to end abstinence-only sex ed and increase support of women and girls. So with ending abstinence-only education, we need to modernize how sex ed is delivered in the U.S. Um, abstinence-only until marriage, which is also referred to as sexual risk avoidance programs, have been proven ineffective at their primary goal of getting young people to delay sex until marriage. Um, so we need to advocate for medically accurate, LGBTQ plus inclusive and culturally responsive sex education. And this helps prevent unplanned pregnancies improves the lives of children and parents, protects the environment, and dispels myths about sex with or without marriage. Um, so this next graphic uh, is another um, response from the survey that went out this year, um, showing how people are willing, how willing people are to be involved in um, policy agendas around sex ed. Um, so most are really excited to be involved. And why, it's why do you need to do this on the local level? is because sex ed policy is largely decided on the state level and there's a lot of variation in what is mandated. Um, so that's potentially illustrated. I have a poll question for the audience about um, what kind of sex education did you receive? So if we can get our poll up. Um, so if you, can, if you can think back to what you received in school, uh, your options are comprehensive, abstinence plus, abstinence only, uh, none or whether you, you don't remember. So we'll give folks some time to respond to that. And in case you're unfamiliar with um, what these different categorizations are, uh, comprehensive sex ed addresses sexual development, relationships, body image, gender, abstinence, contraceptives, and disease prevention. Abstinence plus emphasizes abstinence, but does mention contraceptives and disease prevention. Abstinence only is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It 
mentions that as the only form of contraception um, and none and don't remember are self-explanatory. And if you're calling in on the phone, um, you won't be able to vote on this. This is only if you're uh, logged on online. And we'll give people a few more seconds to respond. And can we show the results? All right, so yeah, this is kind of what I expected, that it'd be a pretty solid mix of all of them. So I just wanted to do this to illustrate what a patchwork this is across the country. Um, so I had a pretty different sex, uh, sex ed experience from Kelly. I grew up outside of Philadelphia and had comprehensive sex ed throughout my public education in the early aughts. Um, I was taught about different forms of contraception, their efficacy, and which ones also offer disease prevention. Um, and I thought this was totally the norm for everyone in public school until I moved out of state and learned that was very much not the case. Um, so to move on to ge gender equity then, um, and increasing the support of women and girls. So despite progress towards gender equity, gender equality in the U.S. continues to persist in many forms. And this includes disparity within politics, education, jobs, and household labor. And in 2020, the World Economic Forum ranked the U.S. 53rd in terms of gender equality out of 153 countries. And according to a 2018 UN report, climate change and its effects have a disproportionate effect on women. So while no one is immune to climate change, women are among the most vulnerable as they are more likely to become victims of scarcity, drought, food insecurity, and increased disease. And Project Drawdown lists education of women and girls as one of the top climate change solutions um, by reducing population growth. And women with more years of education have fewer and healthier children and actively manage their reproductive health. And educated girls realize higher wages and greater upward mobility, which contributes to economic growth. This is such good information. Um, can you tell us more about what's happening with family planning at the international level? Sure, yeah, so since population growth is glo a global issue, we need to be supporting projects across the world. There are 234 million women that want to delay pregnancy but don't have access to contraception. International family planning and reproductive health programs are essential to empowering women and improving the health and lives of millions of people. The solutions here are to restore the U.S. contributions to the U.N. Population Fund and repeal the global gag rule. So supporting international family planning programs, including the UNFPA, supports the lives of women and children around the world. It protects the environment, relieves stress on climate while encouraging social progress, and decreases the risk of conflict. The requesting fund funding level is our fair share of the global financial commitment necessary to address the unmet need for modern contraception. And the global gag rule is a harmful policy that undermines access to contraception, HIV, AIDS services, and maternal health care, contributing to more unintended pregnancies and more unsafe abortions. It bans U.S. aid to foreign NGOs that even use their own non-U.S. funds to do abortions or abortion counseling. Research shows that ironically this doubles the abortion rate because it decreases money NGOs receive for contraception, it upsets the doctor-patient relationship, hampers HIV AIDS prevention, and makes it difficult for groups to respond even to TB, malaria, and childhood nutrition. That's so rough. Um, so I'm just struck by how good you guys are at talking about these issues and how comfortable you are and it's your job, but I'm wondering what you're doing to help other people be more comfortable having these conversations. How do you help people talk about population? Sure, uh, we have lots of practice. <laughs> and we use social media and we'll share pictures of wildlife in human habitats to help people connect with our impact. Uh, we put out a called PopEx um, and we have creative media such as videos um, that help get this information out. So we actually have an example of a video to play for y'all. Now, while most contraceptives are highly effective at preventing unwanted pregnancies, there is one foolproof method. Pairing socks with sandals has been scientifically proven to prevent pregnancy by deterring any contact with the opposite sex. Dad, we're grown adults now. Isn't it a little late to be having the talk or whatever this is? I know what you're thinking. 
What is international action star Ed Begley Jr. doing talking to his blossoming children about sex? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm saving the world. You said that we had to come home for an emergency. This is an emergency. Did you know that one of the biggest threats to wildlife and their habitats is rapid human population growth? Nearly half of all U.S. pregnancies are unplanned. <sighs> Please tell me you're done now. You can do your part by showing young lovers all the tools they need to avoid intimate moments all together. <laughs> you don't have to sit through Ed Begley Jr.'s sex talk to save wildlife. Just use contraception, support reproductive rights, and speak up for sex ed in schools. Wow, that's way better. What if I still have time to return these fedoras? Do your part and find out other world-saving tips at betterthaned.org. So that was, um, and the next one up was another PSA. Uh, Ed Begley Jr. did a series of PSAs about our population and sustainability issues. Um, so you'll see humor is a big component of uh, a lot of the work we put out. And um, the outreach effort, effort I am focused on is our endangered species condoms. So I'm gonna show one on screen. It says, can't refrain, remember the whooping crane. And then you open up your little package and there are your condoms along with more information. Um, so yeah, with cute illustrations and punny phrases, they're a great educational tool to break the ice and get people talking about human population growth. Um, if you have a partner and you need to discuss family planning with, um, or a friend or family member you want to encourage to have safe sex, the endangered species condoms are going to make that conversation a lot more approachable. Because who doesn't love a cute little animal telling you to be safe? Um, and the endangered species condoms have been around for 11 years now. And the idea was that human population growth, growth needed to be brought back into the environmental conversation. Um, and someone had the idea to give out condoms with that fun messaging to drive that point home. So there have been various designs over the years. Um, and we'll have a few, few slides showing them. Uh, so this slide right up here is the first batch. Uh, so you've got cover your tweedle, save the burying beetle, use a stopper, save the hopper, pump smarter, save the snail darter, wear a condom now, save the spotted owl. And then we've got some more to share. Uh, don't go rare, bear, panthers are rare. Be a savvy lover, protect the snowy plover. In the sack, save the leatherback. And safe intercourse saves the dwarf seahorse. And this next one is um, from our current set that are available. And uh, we've got for the sake of the horned lizard, slow down love wizard. When you're feeling tender, think about the hellbender. Before it gets any hotter, remember the sea otter. And the one I just showed you, can't refrain, remember the whooping crane. So these are all North American species that are specifically threatened by human population growth. And um, inside the package, along with messaging about our solutions, there's also more information about the threats those species face. Um, a few years ago, we also debuted Spanish language package designs. Um, and I won't make everyone suffer through my pronunciation, but here's what they translate to. Uh, we've got protect the wolf, covering it all. Save the vaquita, don't sow your seeds cover your thing, protect the butterfly, and save the bear, put on your hat. Um, and obviously they the actually rhyme in the Spanish. <laughs> and then last summer, uh, to celebrate the project's 10 year anniversary and having given out a million condoms, we had a slogan contest. And the winner's slogan was used for the newest package design. And that winner was, before your clothes hit the floor, think of the California condor. Those are so great. They crack me up every time. And when I go talk to college classes and biology classes or whatever, I always take them and the college students love them. Um, so tell us about when and where you give these out. Yeah, so what you actually just described is a perfect example. Um, so we have a nationwide network of volunteers who distribute the condoms at college campuses, parties, community events, and group meetings. Um, basically, anywhere people think they can have an audience and ample opportunity to engage in the conversation about how our growing population affects wildlife. So the condoms are available to, available to be given out throughout the year. Uh, we do focus on particularly relevant holidays like Valentine's Day because of date night and Earth Day to um, remind people of why this is an environmental issue as well. Uh, we've also started giving out condoms during our Pillow Talk, which is our outreach program. And this takes place during adult focused events at zoos and museums. Um, so while they have a big event, we will send volunteers and table with the condoms um, to get that message out. And our volunteers will facilitate interactive activities to illustrate consumption patterns along with explaining the messaging of the condoms. And these event attendees 
are more likely than the average person to want to know ways they can reduce their individual impact and help wildlife, um, but they often haven't heard that safe sex can be a great way to do that. Um, and lately, things have obviously changed. Social distancing has affected how our distributions work since it may be a while before it's safe to gather for events um, or be giving things out to strangers and starting conversations. But our volunteers and partners have found really creative ways to keep using the condoms um, as an icebreaker to talk about population. So some organizations are giving the condoms away as prizes or part of swag bags for their virtual events. Um, we also have people posting them on social media and health clinics and doctor's offices are sharing them with patients. Um, you could also focus your outreach on the families, uh, family and friends you are seeing in person or virtually. So I actually took some of these to the Freshwater Mollusk Conservation Society meeting because they have this raucous auction every year and they auctioned off and everyone loved them. So that was really great. But how can other people volunteer to, to give these out? Yeah, uh, you can request the condoms by going to our website and that website is endangeredspeciescondoms.org. Um, and if you click on the action tab, you can click to sign up the condoms. Um, also on that website, we have a lot of helpful resources for your distribution, little tips and tricks, um, and additional flyers and information. Um, and at the moment, just a, a note, uh, we only send condoms within the US um, and we get a lot more requests than we are able to fulfill. Um, so when it comes to selecting our lucky recipients, we look for ideas that provide an opportunity for discussion, like having a booth at events, um, instead of something like having a, a, just a basket of condoms out for people unattended. Um, so other distribution ideas, if people are looking for ways to help out, um, we would love to support um, if you're a teacher for a class where these topics are relevant, um, we are able to, me or Kelly are able to present virtually or in person potentially um, to your students. And if you're a part of another conservation or environmental group that you think should be discussing this more, um, we can partner together on a population event and a condom distribution. That's awesome. So beyond giving out condoms, how can our members help? So we, we heard this last week, um, we want to build people power. So first and foremost, vote this November. Um, but also I want to echo what Sarah said. One of my roles at the center is to build collaborations for this work. If you're involved with a family planning group, another environmental organization, or teach at a college or university that would be willing to introduce me to your contacts, that would be awesome. Um, we would love to follow up with them and see if there's any partnerships or collaborations. So, and as I mentioned earlier, the Health and Human Services Department is working to undermine the Title X program by promoting natural family planning over other contraceptive methods. They're emphasizing discredited abstinence-only messaging among adolescents and blocking funding for clinics that provide, refer, or discuss abortion services. So as a result, many organizations were forced to close or restrict their services, impacting people on the planet. So, we're looking for you to urge the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to restore the integrity of the Title X Family Planning Program. And we'd also love to see you get involved with, in sexual and reproductive health and rights, not just at the federal level, but at your state and local levels. So now we are going to turn to questions. And this is going to be um, there's already a lot of questions and people emailed questions in and when the invitation went out, I actually got a lot of emails today. Um, and one of them was about immigration. So I was wondering if you could just talk to us about immigration. The email I got was actually very hateful. So <laughs> Sarah, do you want to take it? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Just talk to us about, um, I've heard that the U.S. population is growing more from immigration than from our birthright, and I've actually gotten several emails about this myself since the invitation to this webinar went out. So I just wondered if you wanted to address that. Yes. Um, so population is a global issue, not just any one countries. Um, and like Kelly said earlier, we have a stance on immig um, immigration rights. Um, that immigration and the pursuit of better circumstances are basic human rights. And while there's room for debate over the best methods to manage immigration, we don't view it as the best way to address population growth um, and overconsumption. Um, and we might be able to provide that link to the statement too if people wanna read the whole thing. So someone's posed a question, 
What about trans and non-binary groups in this work? Is this work only relevant to women? Can you talk more about your efforts to be inclusive? Want me to take that, Sarah? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll definitely be the first to say that's definitely an area we can improve on um, and work on partnering with those groups. Um, we're definitely learning ourselves along the way. Um, we do make a point to um, try to use the word people instead of women when we can. Um, we maybe did not do that perfectly tonight. Um, but yeah, that is an area we're, we're working on. It definitely can, can be improved. Yeah, and I would say I think, um, you know, as we continue to build these collaborations with our reproductive justice and uh, health and rights groups, you know, we can learn so much from them on how to, you know, open this work up to other folks that may not self-identify in, in the work that we're doing right now. So as Sarah said, we're definitely looking to build that out and, and improve and provide resources for them. So we have a question about third world and developing countries. And I think there's actually two facets to this. One is how to improve education and rights for women there. And then the other one is just address the perception that the problem is in the United States, that it's, we can just point the finger at other countries. Well, I'll start, Sarah, if you want. Yeah, there's a lot to tackle. Um, I, I think that, you know, the center's unique in the work that we do, that we don't really work in developing countries on this. Um, you know, we definitely support the, the programs that I mentioned, UNFPA and repeal of the global gag rule. But um, we don't have, you know, people in developing countries working on the ground. Um, and I, I think that's important because as, you know, we are high consumers in the United States. You know, one person born in the United States is going to have a larger environmental footprint than one in a developing country. So I think it is important that we not only support, support the international family planning groups, but, you know, really do the work that we're doing here domestically to support our, our reproductive health allies. Yeah, and I would just, um to kind of support what Kelly said. The, the graphic I showed earlier that showed the impact of having one less child that saved so much more tons of carbon emissions compared to other actions, that's based on US consumption. That's not gonna be the same impact for all countries. So it's really that um, population is only part of it. Consumption patterns are the other part that are really important to talk about when addressing it in the US. Thank you. Um, what advice do you have for broaching these conversations in conservative areas of the country? Like I went to high school in Kentucky and I took AP biology and we didn't cover the second half of the book. Like we stopped at meiosis. We didn't even get to like sex or evolution or any of that. I'm not kidding. So in conservative areas, what's your advice? It's specifically for teachers that teach in more conservative areas. I mean, Sarah, you want to take it? I'd love to plug the condoms more. <laughs> Well, I mean, I realize not all schools, um, again, pending state, local, school district policy may not be able to give out condoms, um, but maybe you can still share the graphics that come on the packages as kind of a way to um, help students understand the impacts of this on wildlife. Um, I think it's also important, um, a lot of younger people may not want to have kids for a number of reasons, you know, finishing school and everything, um, but also the environmental message carries through to your adult years when it's maybe more expected to have kids. Um, so I think it's important to introduce those topics early. Um, so I think the humor is a great way to go about it. And I know sometimes, again, with our pillow talk events, um, when we've uh, asked if we can participate in events that are in more maybe uh, considered conservative areas, um, the way we approach it is we're not forcing the condoms into anyone's hands. We let them know what they are. We let the humor draw them in. Um, if they don't want to take it home. There's nothing we can do to force it. You know, choice goes both ways. Um, but we just try to make that conversation as approachable as possible. And I'll just add to this, this isn't necessarily in relationship to conservative areas, but you know, one of the places where we feel like we have a role because we are not a healthcare provider and Sarah will never give out enough condoms, you know, to support everybody that needs a condom. Um, but one of the things that we can do is help destigmatize this topic of just sex in general, right? And I think that's what the condoms can help do, um, as we've talked about with humor. But 
you know, we've been doing this research, this national research, and it's really kind of across the board. You know, some people are, are not um, talking about their desired family size with their partner, much less their family or friends or their healthcare provider. And so I think there's just this um, inherent concern and, and difficulty in talking about it. And, and I don't necessarily think that that's just geography based. Um, but clearly, as Sarah and I had different, you know, childhoods, it, it can be that. But um, but I think we just need to to put it out there more in the media, which the center is really good at. You know, we like to say we want to win in the court of public opinion along with the courts. So, um, you know, we work really hard to get these messages out there to normalize it. So there's a couple of questions asking for specific numbers. I don't know if you guys talk about specific numbers. Um, is there an annual human population growth target that is ideal? And why won't you say how many children couples should have? You want me, which, you want to take it, Sarah? Sure. Um, we, we don't have a growth target other than stabilizing growth. Um, and the reason that there isn't, we don't record there, we don't, suggest any uh, ideal number of kids for couples to have is because it's, it's a choice. Uh, we just want all kids to be planned for and wanted. Um, so we don't want to prescribe anything because um, that gets at that choice element. Thank you. There's a lots of questions about education. Somebody wants to know if there's a proven most effective school-based sex education program. I can take this. Um, yeah, there is, uh, it's this, you know, comprehensive sex ed. So there is research that shows, um, and we can maybe put this in the chat later or on Slack, research that shows that, you know, abstinence only sex ed is, d does not work um, in, in preventing teen pregnancies. So I would definitely look up your, um, the, the type of sex ed that is taught in your school system. And it can, as, as Sarah said earlier, not only at the state level, at, at the local level, very uh, dramatically. And generally, it only comes up for review like every five to seven years. And so you need to kind of, you know, get with your school board and figure out what kind of program they're already teaching and then when it may be coming up for review if you want to work on, you know, going from abstinence only to abstinence plus or, or hopefully comp comprehensive. Um, did I answer the question? I can't remember. Oh. Yeah, the question was just, is there, what's the most effective yeah. education okay. program? And there's a, there's, there's a great, there's a great um, website called SICUS, S-I-E-C-U-S, that um, is like a national organization for sex ed. So you can, the way you can also look for contraceptive deserts in your local community, you can also go on their website and get a report card for your, your state's, you know, sex ed programs. I think there's a lot of teachers on the webinar tonight and let's just give them a shout out for teaching during COVID and teaching all the time. Um, someone's asking about resources for younger students, not condoms, but materials to help younger students understand the connection between wildlife extinction and human population. Yeah, that's something we're working on um, since, um, because we do address all these other consumption things. So kind of um, adapting some of the materials that we have that are for adult events. <laughs> Um, and realizing that not everyone be able to give out condoms to their students. So helping um, students be able to better understand all the other aspects of consumption um, before having a child uh, that can go into that. So that's something we're working on um, and hopefully we'll have that to share in a little bit. Well, I mean, Sarah, yeah. she's working, she's being modest, I think. She's working on a Girl Scout patch. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Um, so I'm, I live in Western New York and I'm working with the local Girl Scout Council here. Um, on a healthy people, healthy planet patch to um, help their girls better understand these connections. So that's, that is an example of something in the works. It just hasn't <laughs> happened yet. And um, we're also both trained facilitators for a program called Pop Ed. And so if, if a teacher is looking for, um, you know, curriculum, they may want to jump over to that website. So do you guys have any evidence that this program is working or that it's effective? That's a hard one. The condom program? Yeah. I think in the way we, so we can't take 
responsibility for falling birth rates in the US, as like good news as that is. Um, but I would say evidence that this program is working is that we have hundreds of volunteers giving out these condoms. So that's probably thousands of conversations that are happening. Or like I said earlier, how last summer we celebrated giving out a million condoms. So you could equate that to a million conversations about this. Um, so I'd say without the program, there'd be a lot less people talking about this um, and getting information about the good solutions out there. And I, I would say too, I think, you know, Sarah is doing a good job trying to build up, uh, you know, a, a program and a system to be able to capture some of these stories. So, you know, more on the qualitative side of things. And um, I think that, you know, it, it may not be, as she said, like we can say that falling birth rates or the number of condoms that we gave out, you know, prevented X number of pregnancies. But um, I think that qualitative research is really important to dive into the nuances to help us inform our program going forward. You know, so what were the barriers and the issues that people encountered when trying to have these conversations and how can we support them in going forward? So you know, one of the other things that we learned from our national survey about this work was it's a, it's a complicated topic. And so part of why we did that um, infographic at the top of the, the um, webinar was because we are, like I said, it's the first question I get every time I tell people what I do and they're like, how does family planning relate to wildlife? And so we need to try to build tools and resources for folks to be able to do this um, in an uncomplicated way. Um, it honestly wasn't anything more than that. You know, the political climate wasn't the top answer. Um, you know, it was really just that it was a, it was a difficult um, conversation, a complicated conversation. What about adoption? There's a specific question about adoption as helping to reduce your carbon footprint. You take that. Um, adoption is a tricky one. Um, so sort of when you start to like, if you're trying to work out the numbers, like yes, adopting a child is giving a child a home that's already here on this planet instead of adding one. Um, depending on what that child's lifestyle would have been or is currently before it gets adopted, um, I think it's probably a safe assumption that its um, lifestyle would probably be increasing and its footprint may increase through the adoption. So it might be likely that people with the resources to adopt have a higher footprint. Um, again, I'm making some like very big generalizations there. Um, so adopt, I mean, if adoption is your choice and you are interested in it, like it's great. Um, I just wouldn't like label it a clear solution or, or alternative. We're getting feedback to your earlier answers in real time. Um, people want to know why, in, instead of just saying it's a choice, why don't you don't encourage people to only have one or two children and to adopt after that? Um, I'll, I can take that just because it kind of trails off the adoption one and Kelly jump in whenever. Um, I mean, I don't think adoption is accessible. Like I've never looked into the process, but I've heard it's, it's not entirely, it can be expensive, time consuming. It's not accessible to everyone. So that's like, not super easy to just suggest to like tack that on. Um, and yeah, I mean, other, we just tell them the impact of having one child. Um, still telling people one or two and, and then adopt um, as an addendum just still is like prescriptive and that's not what we're about. There's a question about the environmental impact of disposing of condoms. I can also take that since con isn't my name. Um, yeah, uh, this actually, I get, I get this question far more often than I would have thought. Um, the correct way to dispose of a condom is to put it in the trash. Don't flush it down the toilet. Um, they can create all kinds of sewer blockages and gross water litter there. We actually, after um, talking with a local waterkeeper group in my area, they um, let me know about that and actually suggested we include that on our packaging. Uh, so now in our newer printed packages of the condoms, uh, we have a note about proper disposal and we have more we have like a frequently asked questions part of our website about the environmental implications of condoms. Um, another common question I get is if they are biodegradable, um, which in itself is its own little rabbit hole of um, biodegradable doesn't have a time period of when something like how fast it degrades. Um, so eh, what we say there is um, one condom in a landfill is a less of an impact than an unplanned child. So kind of just look at some trade-offs. 
And if I can, as a fan, family planning counselor, if I can also say something about the condoms, <laughs> uh, you know, they practice how to use them <laughs> and how to put them on and teach your children, your students, actually how to use them. I'm trying to get Sarah to put that in the package. <laughs> we have limited space. <laughs> And also, like, for people who are worried about a condom not being biodegradable, like, condoms are going to use far less resources than the resources a human would live, use over the course of their lifetime, if you're just, like, trying yeah, to weigh exactly. the impact there. Um, so are there politicians who talk about these issues? Yeah, so we asked this question, uh, we asked a question on our national survey that was, you know, do you vote for policymakers that support, oh, I'm not going to have the wording exactly right in my head. Oh, no, it was, do you vote for policymakers that acknowledge population impacts the environment? And one of the pieces of feedback we got for that was there should have been like a, a response that said, would love to vote for these policymakers, but I don't know who they are right? So it's not something that often gets asked in a town hall or, you know, it's not on the literature or whatever. So we've talked about how to kind of make that more transparent. So, you know, when we ask that question again in a couple years, people might be able to say, yeah, I'm voting for those folks because I know their stance on it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of tough to know especially at every level, you know, federal, state, and local levels, who's voting and what their stance is. Do you have advice for having these conversations with your own family members? Or people talking about this with their families? Um, <laughs> We're the most desensitized to this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I went to my, like, my personal uh, experience um, so it can be difficult. Um, you know, it can be difficult. I, I, I'm remembering a, a difficult conversation with my partner, a difficult conversation with my family. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll just be honest. I, I went to counseling to try to figure out what, what type of, what size and type of family I wanted. Um, and so maybe that is is something that's that's needed or you know find a, a trusted confidant or clergy or or healthcare provider that can walk you through this um there is a uh website it just dawned on me called beforeplay.org and it has various prompts for the person that you're trying to talk to about um contraception and, and the size of your family and um kind of a, a little script that you can follow. You know, if they say this, you could say that. And if, you know, so it, it might help with some of those conversations. Someone asked if the center endorses sterilization. Kind of I, a broad question. I would say um, the clarifier I would need is if it's sterilization you are choosing to do. Um, if you would like a vasectomy or a tubal ligation and you have a doctor that can do that for you, Yes, by all means, like that is a form of contraception. Um, I feel like sterilization though is often associated with forced sterilizations, which are um, one of the many injustices that have happened in the name of population control and not, we do not um, endorse that at all. This is a very specific, condom specific question. Are latex alternatives as effective? Um, I'm pretty sure yes. Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know that answer. Yeah, I, yeah, what I can speak, I mean, um, yeah, because then there are a couple alternatives, because I think there's lambskin, then there's polyurethane, maybe. Um, we, I can, and I can speak to our, the brand we give out, um, is latex because it's vegan. Um, but yeah, um, I would recommend uh, probably Planned Parenthood or another organization called Bedsider um, have really great online resources about all kinds of forms of contraception and they have details about efficacy. So I do like to direct people to the, um, the family planning organizations that really specialize in that information. <laughs> um, so yeah, <laughs> double check me on that one. 
So several people have asked about the link between income level and lack of access to family planning resources. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is that concern. Um, you know, if you were to go to the website Power to Decide and look at where the contraceptive deserts are, you know, I think there's a lot of um, things that go into a low performing or, or you know, a, an area that is a desert. Um, but I don't know if it overlays with any kind of like income I'm trying to think, I don't know if it does. It could just be political boundaries almost, or, um, you know, Sarah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I mean, other than like, there is that debate of whether like contraception should be required um, for people on welfare and just with that, no, um, that shouldn't be a burden put on them. And overall, the average number of children in a family on welfare is 1.9, which is about the same as the general population. Um, so that would maybe point to no. You know, I was also thinking like the Affordable Care Act comes into play here. So part of why the, um, what the Affordable Care Act was gonna do was kind of level that playing field and, you know, make contraception free and easily accessible to everybody regardless of, you know, your status. And so I, I think that that is still a, a, the goal that we should be going for and kind of Title 10 helps to alleviate some of that gap. Um, but, you know, it, it's tough, you know, because we don't have universal health care, if you're not um, working and you didn't get into the, you know, healthcare marketplaces, um, and, and if you're not eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, then, you know, it's, it can be difficult. So, um, yeah, it, it just needs to be, uh, you know, as we've said, universal access to contraception should be, a, it's a human right to be able to have access to this. And um, it's unfortunate that not everybody does. You just answered another question. Someone had asked about the Supreme Court decision and supporting Medicare and contraception for all. Um, someone has a question about how do you talk about the importance of males taking more responsibility in family planning? Sarah, you want to talk about the campaign we had previously? I know it was both before our times. Yeah, um, a few years ago, um, both before Kelly and I were at the center, um, we did have a campaign called Get Whacked for Wildlife uh, that encouraged men to uh, make a pledge to get a vasectomy. Um, if they were done having kids. Um, and I believe you could get a really cool t-shirt with a polar bear holding a pair of scissors on it. Um, and every now and then I still get an email about getting, asking for a t-shirt to this day. So that has seemed to have some lasting <laughs> uh, success and motivating. And I, I would say too, on the, um, the research and development side of things for contraception, you know, there are lots of, well, not lots, a handful of groups that are trying to find like the other forms of male contraception besides a condom and a vasectomy, you know, whether it's a pill or a vaccine or, you know, whatever, uh, some form of reversible contraception for men. So there's a, a, a lot of things that, you know, could be done on that realm. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Kelly and Sarah, and thank you at home for joining us today. Tomorrow, we're going to be on Slack from 12 to 1 Pacific to answer your questions and continue this conversation. You're going to get an email that has a link to an action alert so you can help take action and help improve these issues. Um, on Thursday, July 16th, Brittany is going to be leading the next webinar, and it's going to be a discussion about our campaign for justice along the borderlands and the awesome wildlife that live there, including jaguars, and our work to defend human rights in the region. And I want to thank Brittany and Karina for doing tech on the webinar today because they are awesome and really make this magic happen. So thank you to all of you and you at home, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.